everybody. This is uh, creating a dystopian society in your writing. Um, maybe if we want to just start by doing some introductions. Wes, do you want to begin? Hi, my name is Wesley Chu. I am an Angry Robot author, best known for the Tao series. I also have a new book coming out, a new series coming out, I should say, called Time Salvager, coming out with coming out from Tor McMillan starting next Tuesday. Uh, it's, not coming, it's not out yet, but uh, Dream Haven does have a few copies left, I believe. My name is Naomi Kritzer. I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer from the Twin Cities. I had, about five, I had five novels come out about a decade ago, and uh, more recently I had a um, Basically, a serialized novel in FNSF set on a dystopic libertarian seastead. I'm Farah Bazgaret. I am uh, head of propaganda, I mean publications, <laughs> for Convergence. Um, back in the day, I helped. I co-wrote the uh, Pacific Rim source book for uh, Cyberpunk 2020 role-playing game. Uh, then I went into e-commerce, and now I work for Hennepin County. So. The whole spectrum of dystopia. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Carrie Patel. I'm a novelist and narrative designer, designer for video games. Um, my first two novels, The Buried Life and Cities and Thrones, which is also out Tuesday and which you can also pick up at the Dreamhaven booth, uh, take place in these underground cities that are sort of cut off from history and somewhat cut off from one another. Um, and on the video game side, I worked for Obsidian Entertainment and wrote for Pillars of Eternity. That's my experience. Ooh, uh, do you want me to ask questions? I, I, don't, I don't know if we ever... Oh, you've just volunteered. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Uh, so I was thinking about this, and, um, uh, well, let's, let's start the first question. What, what makes a dystopian society believable? I think one thing that, for me, helps believability a lot is you want to see the roots of the dystopia. Like, you want to see sort of how did this world come to be you know, even if it's not really a significant chapter um, in the book, like, you know, by the end of The Hunger Games, you kind of understand that this world came to be because, you know, it was sort of this, you know, post-war society with a lot of scarcity, and they made this somewhat sensible division of, you know, well, these different communities produce these different things, and, you know, they, they produce them for one another. Uh, you see that that's, that that's the origin, and then you see it break down, and the story is about what happens after the breakdown. Um, I think another thing that really helps believability in dystopia is seeing a problem that feels familiar. Um, I think you see this in dystopias like uh, The Running Man, where you see this really scary corporate overreach and kind of this, um, you know, this obsession with reality TV and this very dark sort of entertainment. Um, there was the, the Jared Butler movie, too, where everybody plays video games, but the people are in the video games. Gamer. Gamer, yeah, there we go. So similar sort of idea, there's, there's something in there, or in The Handmaid's Tale, sort of this scary sort of uh, set of conservative values, this sort of Tea Party sensibility, but you see that and you recognize it and you think, ooh, okay, I can kind of see how we get there and it's quite unsettling. And I think that's also a big part of what makes dystopia effective and believable. Um, damn, you, you took all my good talking points. <laughs> um, I think we're done, actually. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, basically just um, finding the, the, the origin of the dystopia, realizing that the people in charge think it's a utopia. They're, they're not villains in their mind. The people in District 1 are creating a better world for themselves and almost everyone else. And the large portion of society that will go with it, it's only dystopic to those elements that don't agree. And so showing that the the powers that be, however horrible we may think they are, are not villains in their minds. They think they're creating a better world. And for most of them, it may very well be. Yeah, the uh, in some ways, if you're familiar with the Le Guin story, the ones who walk away from Omelas, like it's it's a, it's a very short story about this place that's perfect, perfect paradise, except for one child who's locked into a room and starved and abused. And like a, a dystopia story is about that child, about the person and the, the people in the society who pay the price. Um, I'll say the thing that breaks dystopias for me is when 
like I look at it and I'm like, like where do these people get food? You know, like there's, there's even in a dysfunctional society there has to be a certain functionality to it for it to work for me as believe as you know as a believable setting. And uh, you know if if, uh, if you're just like way like in that walled city where the pretty people live, you know, where's their power plant if they have electric lights? Where's their you know where are they getting the where are they getting their their nice luxuries? You, you're seeing no evidence of 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 trade with anyone else in this weird, isolated, wherever they are, so. I, mean, I agree with most of the panel. I mean, the dystopia is, is an idea of the beholder, you know. If, if you are one of the blessed few and you're on top, then, yeah, then yeah, that things are pretty good. But um, I, I, I do disagree that I think you don't need a utopia for anybody. It could be a dystopia across the board, you know. It could be just life just sucks for everyone. And that, that, it doesn't have to be a society that, you know, I mean, pure damn thing actually was really good dystopians because there is no power structure. It's just, life is just that way. Um, one thing that kind of breaks the dystopia for me is, we'll use the Hunger Games again as a case study is, you know, we have the districts, the poor districts, and the one, you know, really thriving district. And then they have technology that you wouldn't believe or they materialize beasts out of, out of thin air and rolling flaming fireballs. And, and, and then yet you have, one of the districts like farming for coal and wood, and it, it just, you know, but the thing about a dystopia and to making it believable, it has to be consistent <laughs> across the board with the world, so that when, when it's drawn out, everything is practical in its, you know, dreariness and in, in, in its, in its depression. Yeah, I, that comes into kind of a, a, a discussion on the definitions of dystopia. Uh, because if it sucks for everybody across the board, then it starts going more into what I consider grimdark. Um, you know, you don't have, you know, for in my mind at least, dystopia, could be, because I'm an opinionated person, uh, is a strong social control. It's lawful evil. But someone has to benefit from that law. It is the opposite of a utopia to those who are in the mindset. And it can suck for a lot of people. 1984, most people were scared of the government, but they also didn't have crime. They also didn't have, you know, unemployment. To the leaders, that may be a utopia. It's just, what do they have to do to get that? I think sometimes, though, it's also a matter of perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorite dystopias is Brazil. And you look at that world, and it looks like it pretty much sucks for everybody. Like, even you see the really nice restaurant, and it's still riddled through with these, you know, gigantic ducts. And, you know, the people are still, you know, doing these things that just look dull and nonsensical. And, you know, the really good jobs are still the jobs where you're just sort of sitting there stamping papers. Um, but what, you know, what's interesting about that is that it's really just the main character and the love interest who seem to realize that they're living in a dystopia. Um, and I think it's that, uh, that sort of dissonance between what the main character perceives and what the people around him or her perceive that often makes dystopia so unsettling because, you know, they're in this very crowded place, they're surrounded by other people, um, but they seem to be the only one who gets that something is deeply wrong. Yeah, one of the, one of the stories, sort of classic storylines of dystopia is the person who slowly realizes that they live in a dystopia, you know, a world full of people who take that pot of boiling water pretty much for granted, like the other ones who are like, oh my god, they're all dying. Yeah, and viewpoint does play an important part in telling the story. Um, you know, you have the active figure, like in 1984 or Brazil, who realized that things are gone wrong, but then you also have those great stories where it's the passive observer, the person in the middle classes who doesn't realize things are going wrong. Um, like the father in Harrison Bergeron. Uh, but through the reader's eyes, you realize this is a horrible place to be. The person there just doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. Or have swallowed propaganda enough to, realize, to not realize that they're being told a lie. Is Harrison Bergeron really a dystopia? To me, I, I, I would say yes because of the propaganda and the social control of the PC taken to a uh, political correctness taken to an extreme. Do we live in a dystopia? <laughs> and, any, any society where I'm not in charge, I consider a dystopia. <laughs> but, Keep that in mind, folks. But, <laughs> 
But we definitely have dystopic elements. Uh, we definitely have strong propaganda in my mind. It's just in the United States we have competing propagandas as opposed to somewhere like North Korea or China or other more totalitarian states where it's main, main propaganda. I think another key element of a dystopia is that you can't dissent. And that, you know, uh, saying something that goes against the status quo, you know, trying to raise your voice results in very harsh punishment or um, some kind of social ostracism. Um, and so I, you know, that's an interesting question, but I would say the fact that you can ask that question and we can all talk about it means that we're probably not in a dystopia. Does there have to be a government element for the dystopia? I don't think so, no. I, and I also, I also would disagree that there necessarily has to be like the social control and the censorship. I, uh, I think you can have, um, I think you can have a dystopia where people are punished in various unofficial ways, and uh, where, you, you know, I think you can have an anarchist dystopia where, like, the, the dystopic element is that there is no one who's going to protect you if somebody wants to, you know, gets mad and shoots you. It, it seems like the two extremes are either you've got way too much government or you've got no government whatsoever. And that's like sort of the you know like the post-apocalyptic wasteland uh, mm -hmm. sort of settings. So so let, let, let me ask this: uh, Have you guys read *The Word Man*? Peter B. Bresses? No. Has no. Have you guys read *The Word Man*? Anybody? But let me write that down. <laughs> it's in my two. It's in my two pile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a really big seller. But since no one's read it, uh, I guess we're all talk about it. Never mind. <laughs> 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 what kind of dystopia am I living in right now? <laughs> No, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a police state, but some sort of, a warlord society to me, you know, Mad Max, is post-apocalyptic, not dystopic, in, in my viewpoint, mainly because I come from the, the propaganda viewpoint. Um, Can it be both? I think it's both. I, I, I think it's both. It's definitely post-apocalyptic, and it's pretty dystopic. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really depends on how you want to find opposite of dysto uh, opposite of utopia, either absence of utopia or. I, I honestly my utopia list, gone wrong. My loose definition of a dystopia is that anyone from the outside is going to look at this and say, "Oh my God, I would not live there for anything." And that's what my working <laughs> definition is that you just look at it and you're like, "No." Nope. <laughs> and I think yeah, they both show this. Uh, just something very ugly about civilization and human nature because you know either you've got a government where you are controlled where people have made these decisions to either you know censor themselves or regiment themselves or you know impose all these crazy restrictions on themselves or you have the anarch you know the anarchy the lack of government and just what people do when there's nobody to hold them accountable is what becomes really scary uh, would you consider the world of interstellar dystopic the planet? So like Earth, Earth just, just a society after after that, you know, engineering phase that you might went through where I think society is still functional in that movie. And I think for me that's what makes it's it's a world like it's physically breaking down, but society is still largely cooperating. Like, you know, you see these farmhouses, but like they're not surrounded by barbed wire, you know. Well there's the belief that the moon landing was fake, but that's accepted belief throughout engineers are kind of shunned away and farmers are more embraced. I mean, I think it's just something as hell. <laughs> and, and, and I'm actually like, you know, I'm not even going to plug that, but it's kind of, it's kind of the same, similar kind of world where it's not about a government, it's not, not about control, it's about humanity losing, losing its grip on, on you know, being able to survive. And it's able, being, there is no, there is no like, you know, big brother watching you, it's just we kind of, we kind of messed up. <laughs> And you know we are we are paying for for our short sightedness over the centuries. So and that's that's really what I see interstellar as is it's we started you know it's, an, it's environmental issues we we, we um, did not take care of our planet and that's a that's a global issue global it's not a government issue it's we messed up and because of that you know the government did say hey you know the moon landing doesn't exist and that's because we just can't waste the resources for it but they actually did they actually did create the whole program to send people into space so yeah and that again turns more into not necessarily government control but social control through social belief um, religion can fill this role 
in a lot of places, even if it's not a state-sponsored religion. And I won't bring up any current examples for fear of possibly offending believers in the room. So let me, uh, let me just ask a, a new question for the panel. What are some of your, um, either as a reader or a writer, what are some of your favorite like dystopic themes like when I think about like the 1980s era dystopias I grew up on, they were almost always post nuclear. Um, and one of the one of the themes that cropped up again and again and again is appropriately enough in books for young kids is that you weren't allowed to read. Like that was like the worst horrifying dystopia that you know what I would. So any any thoughts on stuff you? I think one thing that I find really interesting about you know like dystopia is really about survival you know and it's about this this character who lives in this world that we that we would never want to inhabit um, and the interesting divide for me though is between adult dystopia and young adult dystopia and in adult dystopia it seems like the characters are almost always really just trying to survive to try to hold on to some little slice of you know humanity and comfort and safety and they usually fail. Whereas in YA dystopias like, you know, The Hunger Games, the Divergent series, you know, this protagonist is trying to take on the system. And a lot of times they win, and it's a much more optimistic um, version of dystopia. So that's, I think that's kind of one of my favorite things. I like YA. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to favor old British dystopia, so uh, definitely the the fear of the Soviet type of control. So I go back to like 1984 and Animal Farm, V uh, for Vendetta still had that, that good British fear of, uh, of the, the big government without really much able to do about it. Not as optimistic as uh, American dystopias can be. I am big on cli-fi right now. Or which is, uh, I guess, is that, is, that real, is that the actual term, cli-fi? Climate? Climate. Oh. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, I'm cli I think it's something else. Like, it's so, all, you're, you're a writer, it is now an official term. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I own it? Or does that, does that own it. Just own it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. please, please don't tweet that. <laughs> Wesley Chu has created climate fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that, and, and that, that, that's kind of what my bag right now is. You know, I mean, we, we see what's going on you know, within our environment, the politics involved, and we're still starting to see you know, inklings of like consequences of, of what could happen. And what if we took that and we ratcheted it up to 12 and, and <laughs> see you know, what happens when the water rises and when you know, the sun bakes and you know, we run out of fresh water, the trees are all dead. How, how do we as humanity survive and what, to what extent do, do, do we do these certain things in order to keep, you know, to stay alive? I think that's another really interesting theme of a lot of dystopia is that humanity is oftentimes at odds with the natural world and either it's a very barren place as it is in a lot of, you know, post-apocalyptic wasteland Mad Max um, type of science fiction. Um, or it's, it can sometimes be a toxic place, uh, as it is in like Paolo Bacigalupi's The Wind Up Girl, which I think you would probably consider cli fi. Um, yeah, he owns it. Um, <laughs> you know, or it's sometimes it's also a very uncertain space, you know, like in um, 1984 in The Hunger Games, you know, you never, it feels like a sanctuary, but you still never really know if you're being watched. And, you know, since those types of dystopias take place primarily in cities and, you know, very concentrated urban environments, you know, kind of like the outside world. It's like, it's a little scary, it's a little uncertain, and it may seem like a haven for the protagonist, but um, it's actually fraught in its own ways, too. One of my... Do you have some questions? Oh, um, so there's a theme out there. I don't know if it can really be considered technically dystopian because it doesn't involve like really ostracism among people or doesn't really involve surveillance or anything government. But I mean, now that the internet has really sort of polarized a lot of people with a lot of sources of information, we've gotten to the point where people don't necessarily have to see or hear or involve themselves in anything that they don't personally agree with. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you think that that would be a dystopian theme. Oh, it could be one. It could easily be one. And that's like satire dystopia is a great, great uh, model for taking whatever theme is under your skin, bugging you right now, whether it be climate problems, 
the police state religion uh, and just delving into how can we possibly screw that up? And then, you know, how does someone take hold of that? Going to its absurd length and then examining how people deal with that. Then you've created this nice big world. How does your protagonist deal with that world? I mean, if, if you were to break things down, almost anything can be dystopia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can, all our bees can die tomorrow and we'll have a bee-less dystopia within four years. Um, mm -hmm. Sharks can get really smart in the next few years. <laughs> and they're all screwed up. <laughs> and there will be a shark dominant dystopia within like probably 40. Yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it's anything that you fear or we, we fear either as an individual or collectively as society ratchet up by like 15 and, and we're there. Yeah. District my, 9, but I'm sorry, District 9, but with sharks. One of my favorite. Um, one of my favorite dystopias actually sort of brings up the perspective issue because uh, uh, Sherry S. Tepper's uh, The Gate to Women's Country I think was written as a utopia and I absolutely see it as a dystopia. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that uh, that was somebody who was like, well, how would we solve these problems? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the place she went was one that I find horrifying. Well, I think that's another good theme with dystopias is that you know they they never really come across come about by chance. They're all they always seem to be the result of <coughs> conscious human effort. Whether it's you know something we did to the environment that now has made you know resources scarce and the planet difficult to inhabit, um, or you know some social problem we've decided to try to solve through unconventional means, and it's sort of you know this little hell that we create for ourselves. And I think that's part of what makes dystopia so disturbing. Or, or even what Naomi said, um, has, it, has everybody read The Wheel of Time? At the very end of it, can I, can I give a spoiler or is that no, no good? Spoiler out of the way. Spoiler out right. so of the I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Man. The very end of Wheel of Time where, like, where Rand is seeing all the possible worlds that could exist, and one of them was a perfect world where everybody was happy, everybody got along, he saw all his friends, and everything was literally, you know, the, the, the shaitan had, had won, basically, but everything was perfect, everything was like just, Paradise, but then he, he saw behind everybody's eyes and like no one actually had a free choice, you know, and, and and that made it all not worth it because and that was the one thing that mattered to him more more than anything else was that free choice. So and it was a utopia, but yeah, yeah. Well, and in the uh, Avengers, Loki said it best: "I want to bring you freedom, freedom, freedom from choice. You'll you'll be happy. You have you have to be." Uh, fantasy setting, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I, I made an impassioned argument that Harry Potter was dystopic on a panel on Thursday. So uh, any and uh, the, any any society where you can be sent to Azkaban without a trial is clearly a dystopia. See, the house is called that efficient. See. <laughs> <laughs> more dystopias popping up in science fiction and I think it's probably because it's a very it tends to be philosophically very forward-looking and it's kind of this often this um, cautionary tale of where we might be headed um, but they bring up great examples my pet peeve um, with dystopias uh, uh, I have a couple one is one is the people who just are just evil 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 for no apparent reason because you know they're not the hero of their own story they are just bad um, the other is uh, the other is authors who don't do the level of research that would be like looking up something on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, there's a book I read um, where a huge portion of the plot hinges on hemophilia, and like they picked the worst possible genetic disease to be the one that's loose because they didn't want to have gender imbalance. Hemophilia is sex linked, it mostly affects boys, so it, and that, like, it just drove me crazy. So, yeah, do your research. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree <laughs> on that first one. Uh, your best villains are the heroes of their own tale. Dr. Doom thinks he's doing a great, a great service for his country, and most of the people in Latveria are happy. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think uh, Fury also had her hand up. Um, I was wondering if you could <coughs> talk a little bit about the distinction between and the relationship between dystopia and post-apocalyptic fiction because they're not entirely synonymous, but it gets kind of muddled sometimes. Yeah, there can be a apocalyptic post uh, post-apocalyptic dystopia, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I think The Stand is maybe a good example of a post-apocalyptic novel that has a dystopia in it and sort of a very comfortable community. Um, I don't know how many of you have read The Stand, but it's sort of about this, it's like a disease that sort of devastates society and there are very few survivors left. Um, you know, all the good guys, you know, sort of band together, I think probably in Colorado or somewhere, well, wherever it is, you know, they, they create a nice... Yeah, yeah. Not mountains. Just, oh, just out there now. <laughs> but they create a very nice community for themselves, um, and their their concerns are still survival centric. You know, trying to get their town to run, trying to figure out you know how to rebuild themselves, trying to you know survive on a very basic level. Um, and then, kind of on the other side of the country, you have this uh, this society that's organized by Randall Flagg, who's the main antagonist. And there, things actually run a whole lot better. Um, but he's a very scary guy. And what's interesting is you have a lot of pretty decent people working for him um, who either don't really understand what he stands for, you know, or they find community in one another, and so they sort of, uh, they sort of ignore what he's doing. But I think, I think that's a great example of something that's post-apocalyptic and that has one portion of it that is dystopian and one portion of it that's um, just a bit more sort of post-apocalypse survival focus. The distinction I would make is that a dystopia requires a society, and a post-apocalyptic <coughs> story might or might not really have society. It may really be sort of past the point of society <coughs> being a thing. I mean, it's, it's like, I look at the game Fallout, okay? I think Fallout is a, is a post-apocalyptic, I don't think it's a dystopia, you know? Um, I think, we have this assumption that when society breaks down, we are all just gonna go looting and go crazy and you know like like you know become like barbarians. And I don't think that's true. I think you know in, in World War Z, society did break down, and once they got a handle on it, they rebuilt. Yeah. And you can have a post-apocalyptic society that is really just a, you know a rebirth of civilization. While in dystopia things just kind of get worse. There's some great science fiction novels that are post-apocalyptic about people rebuilding civilization. Um, the Postman by David Brin, um, I kind of think that, uh, uh, um, I'm gonna blank on the name, but it's post-nuclear and the guy only wrote the one book until after he was dead. Um, <laughs> Lee Woods, Canical for Lee Woods is also kind of about rebuilding. Like The Road, that's both. <laughs> <laughs> that's really both. <laughs> Where you don't necessarily need an apocalypse. Often with dystopias, there's a big event mm -hmm. which allows someone to start formulating the society. Or it could just be a revolution like the French Revolution, uh, where you replaced one evil with another. And post French Revolution, France was kind of dystopic. Say the reign of terror counts as dystopia, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it could also be pre apocalyptic. Uh, Cat's Cradle uh, by Kurt Vonnegut is. Is a wonderful little dystopia for me. <laughs> All right, let's call this. Yeah, back to um, I'm wondering if any of you have seen uh, Tomorrowland, the movie. Um, no, not a 45 percent left. Get away from Phoenix, <laughs> but it's not really a dystopia. But what it is is the future is actually created by, and it's sort of an allegory for Hollywood. And so, what the the notion of the story is is that people like yourself or whoever writes and produces movies that are dystopic create a feedback loop that then creates dystopia and so the, the theme is all around there's a countdown clock to the actual end of the world and they're going forward and backward and it's based upon how people are displaying the future is creating the future and so there's just an interesting thing that you're saying that you know science or nature or whatever creates a dystopia and in this story, it's actually you guys who create the Well, <laughs> dystopias are always created by people. Yeah. It's whether people have used an excuse of an you know, a, a big event or uh, just managed to convince people through you know, religion or really good propaganda to go along with it. So it, it's very much a human creation. 
There, is a, there actually has been an interesting reaction, I think, some of science fiction writing from people like Neil Stevenson that's sort of looking at this trend of all of these dystopias and saying, like, you know, once upon a time, sci-fi was dominated by these sort of technologically focused and very forward-looking um, pieces of fiction, and kind of what's in vogue right now is, you know, stuff that's not so much science-based and that, you know, just takes a very grim look at the future um, and doesn't necessarily encourage the kind of, you know, development um, that we might like to see. Uh, you know, and I, obviously there's value to both kinds of fiction, but it's, it's an interesting point about, you know, about trends. Yeah, and that, that was one of the uh, reasons why uh, you know, Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World was it was a, a counterpoint to the utopic science fiction of the day. The science can conquer all. <laughs> I actually know somebody who read that as a utopia. Yeah. They read Brave New World and were like, oh, I want to go live there. <laughs> That's I have a place, <laughs> I'd know what I was, who I was, it would be great. Yep, it's always a utopia to somebody. <laughs> well, we'd all be alphas, obviously, so. I don't have to work out what to buy. I do like buying. One of the kind of uh, rip off what Wesley was saying, that when you're talking about Fallout, I think uh, one of the things that makes that, why people might sometimes describe that as dystopia, I think it's actually post dystopic. If you look at the society that the vaults came from there, those are, those are little dystopian sociological experiments where, like, you know, we have, you know, we have people with high levels of verbal aggression, and we have a lot of guns, and the locks on the doors where we keep the guns won't work. We're gonna put these people in here, we're gonna lock them up, and it's gonna be great. And you had the, the societies at the time before the war came, which were very, you know, yeah, which was a very, like, the enclave of the United States was a very dystopic society, you know, do what you're told, think what you're told, and then it all blew up, and then people sort of building something after that. I think, like, I think it's, Post-apocalyptic, but also post-dystopic. I don't know if that's. I don't know. I don't know if post-dystopias are really a thing or a genre, but I was curious if your thoughts on that. It's a very postmodern concept. I mean, no one, no one has, no one is writing it. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, uh, was that too subtle, Wesley Chu? Could you please write this? <laughs> Uh, have the uh, okay, yeah. you then him then me. Yeah, I was just um, just want to say that dystopian novels don't necessarily have to be about tyranny. I'm, I mean, my favorite one for the last few years is the city, the city by Shia Ebel, and the point of that. And like, I read like, did you all read the book or even home? Yeah. Basically, I got to page seventy. I realized it was the exact description of my neighborhood in uh, <laughs> New York. It's like. <laughs> Except we don't call it, you know, this one, that one, we call it Jewish Washington Heights and Dominican Washington Heights. And if it was illegal to talk to, go across the United States, we would probably cross in the United States a lot more. <laughs> hmm. um, would you consider um, Brave New World a, bit of a dystopia? Give it to yes. you guys have been. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, 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 old, it's the old school Brave it's uh, dystopia. dystopia. That's the standard for dystopia. The more yeah. I think yeah. about it, the more it seems like our society is. Like, that Orwell wasn't really well, it, 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 there was a trend, I mean, there was a trend for a long time of writing sort of dystopias as warnings. Like, I mean, 1984 was intended as a warning, Handmaid's Tale was intended as a warning, and uh, Brave New World was intended as a warning. And I'd say evidence shows that it doesn't work. <laughs> because in England, they have cameras everywhere. Yeah. Uh, in in uh, you know the, the U.S., we've seen steady erosion of you know the you know reproductive rights, and uh, you know there's quite a bit in uh, Brave New World that's very much come to fruition. I mean, the, the, this sort of you know this whole idea of like you know if I just warn people, then it won't happen, doesn't really pan out. Yeah, Demolition Man was written as a warning. And we can see that it didn't work by Mayor Bloomberg basically be doing a really elaborate demolition <coughs> of cosplay <laughs> of trying to ban smoking large drinks. Anything that's not good for you is bad for you and must be banned. And he even looks the role. So uh, to kind of get at the uh, dystopias have to be kind of a government and have their propaganda. 
they don't necessarily, uh, I think from like Minority Report, where you actually had a dystopic element in the pre-crime and just the complete civil rights violation that, that is. But then later in the movie, the thing that actually got me horrified was he walks into a Gap store and the voice overhead goes, hello, Mr. Smith, you've, it's been so-and-so, are you interested in jeans like you were the last time? And just that instead of propaganda, you have marketing. Yeah. And instead of Big Brother, you have the corporation. And it's, uh, that sense. yeah, that, that sense of this is what is controlling your life. This is what mm -hmm. it is. It is commerce that is driving you in. And, and, and just the fact that we have that now on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll, 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 Google and Facebook know what books you buy, what clothes you wear, what porn you watch. Yeah. Google knows where I am right now. I mean, I, I, was, I was at San Antonio, uh, a world in San Antonio a few years back, and I was, I was on the panel with a bunch of libertarians. And I mean, the, 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 it, it, was, it was like a libertarian country right here. And, and I said, you know, and they're talking about the NSA, and I'm like, you know, I don't think the NSA might be able to grab some of my data, but I don't think they really care about me. The people who actually care about me, that's like Amazon and Facebook, and I, 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 I'm more afraid of them knowing everything about me and my privacy than the government, because they're a lot more competent, for one thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they actually care about, you know, about the stuff I do, because they're trying to make money off of me. Right. What does the government really want from me? You know, besides they want to make sure you're not going to blow Besides being a little overly protective of the, of, you know, the country, which I could kind of see that in the... And they want to get their cut. Yeah, they don't look very bad at getting the cut. The government, the, 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 these companies are really good at getting my money. Okay? They're the ones that I see, oh, I'm always losing money because I'm buying dumb shit that I don't need. So. Yeah, and if, if anyone here, and I know a few of you were at my propaganda panel, uh, yeah, we but definitely made the case that marketing is propaganda yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. But yeah, I think kind of like what you said, I think um, the point you raise is that, you know, the antagonist in dystopian fiction kind of evolves along with our current concerns, you know, and, and back when communism was more of a force, you know, the dystopias were around these, you know, very structured political parties, um, you know, like 1984, um, you know, and now we're more likely to see the corporate dystopia where the scary thing is these corporations that have rights, like religious rights, you know, and can suddenly control and monitor so many aspects of our lives. Or what's the, that new British series, Dark Mirror? Black Mirror. Black Mirror. Oh, I, I yeah. caught the second episode of that oh. where it's, you, know, you bicycle to make credits mm -hmm. and you have to have, pay credits to not have the advertising well, glaring in your face and I'm like, oh my god, this is beautiful. And I think the dystopia of voyeurism is actually a big element of a lot of Black Mirror. Um, you know, now you, you saw some of that in The Running Man, but I you know, as, as reality TV and kind of these very strange forms of entertainment become bigger and bigger, I think, you know, some of the Black Mirror episodes also touch on this fear that, you know, we're gonna get our kicks kind of watching other people um, have bad things happen to them. That goes all the way back to we. But it's reality. Not, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, ready in the back, then you, then you, and then you. Oh, perfect. Kind of going off the corporate, there's a novel I had to read for a class. It was called Feed. Oh, yeah. That's, That's yeah, where I, right. like, if mm -hmm. dystopia were to happen, I figured that would happen because the corporations would not only take over our daily lives, but take over our schools and start imprinting and just everlasting their control. Yeah, also, already. I was wondering if, like, is that where you would picture a dystopia kind of going, or would you picture more the uh, a giant war would happen and everything would just... Uh, definitely, that was an element in Cyberpunk 2020, uh, although their big event was more of um, running, out of, running out of petroleum products. I definitely think Creeping Dystopia is a, is a plausible setup. Um, Octavia Butler's um, books, uh, Parable, of the, uh, Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, it's not like one big event that sort of tra you know, transforms the U.S. overnight into a dystopia. It's sort of creeping, creeping lawlessness, you know, increasing numbers of walls around communities and paranoia and things like that. Um, and certainly, like you know, sort of you can you can look at you can look at trends like you know the, the U.S. educational systems, you know, increasing willingness to like you know shill for corporate dollars you know, is absolutely like something you can look at and say like, where is this going? What would be the logical outcome here? And I think that's a, that's a, 
it's a it's a, a way you can start to build a dystopic society. To your, I mean, to your on one hand, though, we are really bad at predicting things. So we yeah. we think that we are moving towards a dystopic society. We think you know. It, stuff from 1984, Brave New World is going to happen, and we see we see signs of that, but almost nothing that we've ever predicted has come true. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we we are slow, but we do react to things, and you know, anything if, if anything, look at the past two weeks, and you can see we, as humanity, we, as a society, we do, we are the best futurists. Actually, we're, we're terrible futurists. Yeah. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So, um, this is this is why I'm a fiction writer and not uh, like a predicted essay writer. <laughs> I think there's also just something, you know, in a very dark sort of way that's a little bit fascinating about the idea of dystopia and and also about you know predicting the dystopia that you think you're on the brink of because I think it certainly lends a real sense of importance to what's happening now and the decisions we're making now and the events going on around us if we think. Oh, this is about to be the start of something really big and scary, you know? All right, uh, the individual with the purple hair is head. Um, so, as you were saying, it seems like a lot of dystopias are commentary or warning on current events, but we're also really bad at predicting things. Mm -hmm. When you're picking topics for dystopia in your writings, are you aiming for ones that you think are going to be a threat for a long time, but always sort of on the verge to make it so you <coughs> <laughs> or is it you just kind of accept that, you know, I'm writing this because it's a threat now, but we're bad at predicting things, so this may just seem absurd in 10 years when it's either no longer a threat or so much part of the reality if, that we're in that it just seems weird to think this. If I'm writing a dystopian story, I'm writing a story about somebody in conflict with their environment. And so I want to write, a, a, about, I want to write about an environment that is going to provide interesting conflicts for the character. And then I want to try to make sure it's at least vaguely plausible. So and I am less about the like you know sounding the warning call and more about trying to construct like you know an interesting setting for a good story for characters who will have interesting things to do. And um, uh, I, there is you know to to some extent I I worry I worry less about being dated because it doesn't matter how how hard you try to be timeless you you're, you're doomed to be dated with science fiction. You read stuff from 10 years ago, it can be, um, there's just, there's these weird things that you're just like, wow, you know, they didn't see pocket computers coming, so. Yeah, you, just, you can't chase the market in publishing. You can't chase what you think is the hot new trend. You can't chase what, you know, I mean, and I, I don't know, I don't know if, I, I don't know if I agree that things get dated. I think a good story never gets dated. Okay, but the, the uh, Unless the it's like Y2K, you know, this is a Y2K thriller, then, <laughs> yeah. then, 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 then he, he's, a, he, he's SOL, but you know? Yeah, I mean, William Gibson does, does feel a little dated at point, but, uh, but Neil, like Neil Stevenson, every book is a different thing that appears to be annoying him. And he'll do he'll do a, 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 a novel about it that's fairly dystopic. You know, Zodiac is is uh, environmental, and then he goes into political machinery and advertising. Whatever is annoying him when he decides to write it, um, I tend to look at more as an opportunity to uh, just do that, address something that's annoying me, uh, or. And I would do that with satire as well. Um, so it's very much a current events thing for me rather than I hope this will have long life. Um, I'm sure when Jonathan Swift wrote A Modest Proposal, he wasn't expecting any long life because he was dealing with a very specific topic, which ended up being you know, satire if you got it, hopefully, and also a fairly dystopic idea of eating Irish babies to reduce the problem of starvation in Ireland. I mean, just to add to that real quick, um, the, the, the dystopia is not the main point of a book, okay? All the, 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 having a dystopian world is just a tool, it's just a world that your main, your characters are living in, a world where con that might nurture the conflict. So if, if you are, if you're treating your world, you fall in love with, with your world, with that dystopian world, and then you're gonna add a plot, maybe a plot, maybe some characters, you're kind of going at it ass backwards. Yeah, very much like fantasy or any other type of structure. No. 
as you want. Well, I, I'd say that my approach probably mirrors Naomi's in that I'm, you know, just interested in what's going to create sort of an interesting, interesting setup for the characters to come in conflict and to, you know, tell an interesting story together. Um, but something Wes just said uh, actually kind of raised another question for me, you know, because um, part of the prompt of the panel is like, you know, how does how how does the dystopian element in your society affect character and plot development? You know, like are are you Ideally, when you're telling a story, it's, it's not the same story that could have been told anywhere else. Um, and I, I guess what I find when I'm writing something with a dystopian element is that, you know, the, the world is a, a place full of obstacles. And so the story for the characters is oftentimes about um, overcoming the obstacles of the world around them. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, too, kind of how you guys see the dystopian elements in your work kind of feeding into story and plot and character development. The main character of my dystopic story is a teenage girl who's grown up pretty privileged in her environment. So part of it is just like the, the story of a, of a teenage girl who's slowly realizing how messed up the world she takes for granted is. And because she's a teenager, she is much less inclined to pay any attention when people tell her, like, this can't be fixed, this can't be changed, this isn't the only thing you have power to change. She's like, yeah, no. <laughs> So that's, that's kind of how those two things interact in, my, in the stories that I do. Uh, so I guess I'm, I'm a high concept guy. You know, I, I think about a, a scenario or an idea, and then I build my characters around that, and then I build a world around that. So for, say, for Time Salvager, you know, I, I had a dream one night that I was on the Titanic, mm -hmm. trying to steal the whole diamond. and. Um, you know, I didn't know where the whole diamond was at, so I had to like kind of like I spent a few days on, on the ship, befriending all these you know all, all the passengers and the people who, who ran the ship. And as the ship was sinking, I found the diamond. And so what happened was I knew all these people were gonna die because I'm a time traveler. When the time traveler comes back, I know they're all gonna die. I'm looking for the hope diamond. I find it, and I also know that everybody I talked to didn't know they were dying, but I knew that I experienced the last terrible moments of all their lives, and I couldn't do anything about it. So when, when I woke up, that's why I wrote Time Salvagers, because I wrote about these time travelers whose jobs are to go back in time to obtain resources from the past of what they call dead-end timeline, say, before a ship sinks or before a disaster happens or something blows up, so that once you take the, take the stuff and you jump out, all, all the traces of your activities are, are wiped away. But, and, and so that's the high concept. And then, so what is the world that I need? What is the dystopic world that I need in order to support that? And that would be one, lacking resources, one where we have maybe destroyed our planet and our solar system enough that our only option now is to go back in time to obtain these resources. And then from that, you go to the characters and you go, well, how does that affect the characters? How does, go on, how does a guy whose job is to go back in time to see the last terrible moments of everybody's lives that he can't do anything about it, how does that screw with his head? <laughs> and that's what I wrote Time Salvage about. Yeah, and I tend to go from the, the framework, though so I have, like, like what I said, a, a, a guideline of what's gone wrong. And then I want to explore, okay, how do people live in that uh, and their, their conflicts? And especially when you're running, running a game when you, you have to set up the world and then you have these characters who are all autonomous people, they're the, the players. They're going to find a way to screw up your, your master plan. Uh, <laughs> them and the dice. Damn the dice. <laughs> Oh, yeah, um, yeah, just like I said, for me, it's about um, kind of finding the obstacles within the world. Uh, like the, the two main protagonists of the buried life, you know, one's this maid who's sort of on the bottom rungs of a very strictly organized society, um, you know, and so for her, it's kind of about, you know, finding advantages. And, you know, she works for these people who are very wealthy and very powerful, you know, and she's kind of caught between them and caught between the law at one point. Um, and so, you know, trying to find a little a little way to navigate and survive that space. Um, and then the other protagonist actually is a member of the police force. And so, you know, her arc is a bit more of the arc of, 
you know, looking at the world around her and the structure she works for and starting to question, you know, whether it's, whether it really does anybody any good um, and whether she's chosen the right side. And I, I think both of those are, um, you know, very classic sort of dystopian um, character arcs and, and, you know, sort of character-based stories. You guys sort of touched on this earlier, but why do you think there's that distinction in young adult dystopian versus adult dystopian where young adult is more hopeful? Because you need that hope when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> because, because teen actually this was touched on in the earlier panel I was on, uh, because teenagers have that feeling of, you know, once I get out of the house, once I'm out from under someone else's rules, then things will be all right, which is, seems to be a lot of the elements in, in Hunger Games and other young adult dystopic fiction, which is that once they get out of the house, then they have to be the adults in their kind of word. And that's when you get into adult dystopia where there, there is no hope. <laughs> This is why I like my age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the optimism of you. That's why I hate YA. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the, the most concise explanation I, I've ever seen about what YA is, it's, you know, it's, it's about teenage experience. You know, so it's about what it is when you make that trans no, when, when you make that, make that transformation from a, a teen to an adult. And a, a lot of it is, you know, you have spent a lot of your life being controlled by you're being, being supervised, I should say. <laughs> and it's about how, how do you transfer from that supervision to freedom? And that's why there a lot of teens know why Sophia is about the whole government oppression thing. Is that, that's, the, that's what supervision is blown up, mm -hmm. uh, magnified. And I, I think too, there's a tendency, you know, you when, I remember when I was younger, and you know, when I talked to people who were younger, you know, you look at the people around you, the adults around you, and you think, when I get there, I'm going to do this a lot better. Like, I'm not going to end up in that job I hate. I'm, you know, I'm going to wait for the right one, and I'm, you know, my my marriage will be good, and I'll I'll raise my kids better, and you know, I'll do all these things better. I'll make all the right decisions, um, you know. And and yeah, I guess I guess sometimes you know you get there, and and yeah, the adult life is more complicated than it seems, I guess. And so that's, but I, I think that's where that optimism comes from, this idea that, like, well, I'm not there yet, but when I get there, I'm going to change everything, and I'm, I'm not going to be bound uh, by these, you know, these systems and these, and these other elements that hold people back. And I think also there's an element of, you know, why are, is YA gone so dystopic recently? And I think it was brought up uh, at WorldCon was the fact that young adults and teenagers are looking at the cost of tuition uh, and the job market and it's not a very positive looking future and that's influenced by young, young adult stories rather than being fantasy or, or other genres are kind of going down the dystopian path. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, in terms of what is the utopia versus the dystopia, and how some people in our society may have it as a utopia, um, I feel like as Americans, our culture is very, you know, individual liberty centric. And so, you know, some panelists mentioned how there are examples of dystopians that, like, I would like to live in that, and and how really uh, the way a society is organized is about how society has ranked different values. If this is more valuable than that, you know, how much are you willing to give up with this lower ranked thing? So I wonder if any of you know anything about like how our dystopians are received in other cultures that are maybe more collectivistic instead of individualistic. That's a really good question. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's a little confusing. Um, I lived in, in Japan for three years uh, out in the countryside. And I remember, and this isn't necessarily a, a dystopia, but just American cinema in general. A friend of mine and I went to see Pulp Fiction. We were laughing our asses all the way through it. Um, and the people around us were looking at us curiously because they 
they didn't get some of the jokes just because of language. Uh, but also the situations were a little confusing for them. Um, and in an earlier panel I had in dystopia, someone brought up the point. They have a friend who lived was from Kyrgyzstan. And you know, under the Soviet rule, they had no unemployment, they had no crime. You know, it, it was pretty utopic. They just they were assigned their jobs. Uh, whereas over here we have freedom, but it was a lot more dangerous. So yeah, it, 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 there is a cultural difference. And I would love to do a, a panel sometime on like American dystopia versus uh, British or you know, other countries dystopian, uh, Japanese dystopian. And I'm just, just a quick point. I mean, I, uh, I was talking to an uh, Indian friend of mine and he had a range wedding, okay? And we were just talking about it. I was like, you know, how, how, how can you get married you know, to somebody you barely even know? Isn't that just terrible? Because, you know, I have like, I have a trail of breakups in my, you know, in, in, in my past. So how do you know that? You, how can your marriage survive this? And he goes, Well, you know, our societies are different because where, where I'm from, we're from a very small community. You know, my parents, uh, my parents know who I am. They know who other people are. They probably know us better than we know ourselves, and they can match us better. And in most cases, they have a lot lower divorce rate, and that could be for different reasons. But you know, this is the way their culture has been has been, you know. It's very different from how to We have almost too much freedom in many cases, which is why we have so many more problems that they don't have. But then, again, they have more control on their side that we would never want to you know, assume. Got so. Just a couple more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's have the lady in the glasses, and then... Um, yeah, sorry, you guys talked a bit about the pitfalls of antagonists and dystopia and how you know, we kind of can't just be evil for evil's sake. Do you guys have any tips about uh, pitfalls to avoid for protagonists in a dystopian story or um, pet peeves maybe of yours? Uh, don't be totally pure of heart mm -hmm. and uh, shiny and good. Remember that protagonists are always the product of the environment. And you know, if you grow up like in a situation where it's just understood that you can't talk about certain things, it's going to be really hard to talk about those things. You're not going to be like the one person in society who's like, but wait, this is wrong, unless you have some reason. Or, you know, it, at the very least, if you are the one person who's like, but wait, this is wrong, don't be that person about every <laughs> issue. <laughs> I like to switch places with my with my protagonist and antagonist. Where you know, if if I know my antagonist's motivations and I, I understand that, if I switch him to the protagonist, do both motivations still make sense to me? Like if I was in, if I was in both their shoes, you know, are they are they both? If they present me an argument, would it be difficult for me to actually pick a side? I think they nailed it. I yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think one last question and then final thoughts. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm just thank you to all of this. And um, it, it seems to me that there's the general feeling that uh, our society is in decline. Uh, is it that the be really feeling here? And, and, and is it true? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's always. I think there's a negativity bias sometimes to kind of see the problems around you and to sort of, you know, build your mental narrative around that. Um, I'll say I grew up in Southern Baptist churches and one thing that never ceased to amaze me was how pretty much every few months you'd have a sermon on how the end times are nigh, you know, and, and you look back at, you know, into like the, um, you know, the revivals of the, the 1800s and the early 1900s and people were saying the same thing then. People have said the same thing for a really long time. The end times are always nigh. Um, and it, it makes a great story, but you know, as for whether things are getting better or worse, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think, I think that's probably overly broad, and you have to look at sort of the parts of society that, that are getting better, and um, you know, the parts that aren't. Yeah, for me, I think it's pretty much getting a little bit better. The issue is that with alternate news sources, the internet, uh, cell phone cameras, we can be much more hyper aware of the things that are going bad. So it's more of a awareness reported issue that gives the illusion that things are going downhill when actually that reportage can make things better. Um, as we can see by 
so recent events. I'm a Gen Xer, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s and spent most of the 1980s thinking that I was going to die in a fiery nuclear war before I was 30. So I look around and I think things have gotten a lot better. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, people who think that things are getting worse are the people who forgot what things were like when they were young. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, I think we're pretty much out of time. So, unless people had a final, any final thoughts on the panel, or should we? Yeah. Oh, um, I, I just had one great quote. I have a final thought because I'm obnoxious, <laughs> uh, and it's not actually my final thought, but it was brilliantly stated by uh, Roderick Vincent. Uh, who have on a, uh, doing a guest blog on writersdigest.com. Uh, the key to writing great dystopian fiction is to entrench yourself in current affairs. Does it piss you off? If so, then the fire in your belly will help you create great prose. Can you transfer it to paper? After each passing day, the narrative lie becomes an inkling of truth. Militarization of the police force, Ferguson, Edward Snowden and his NSA revelations, Big Dogs, Petman, and Advanced Robotics. Crony capitalism and the ballooning kleptocracy in a perpetual state of war are all spicy ingredients for the next dystopian stew. So, like I said, find what pisses you off, go right about it. Thanks for coming, guys.